All right. Shall we get started? Hey guys, my name's Alex the Sound Guy and welcome to another Onset Breakdown. In the next three episodes, we're going to be covering my adventures, recording the sound for a live action gridiron game. The production company was Rhythm Content and uh, all their details are in the description below. When it comes to money, we can go to extremes. But what does not-for-profit really mean? Here we go, football! And shred into another unexpected adventure. So this was a fairly complex shoot for sound. The concept was to film an entire gridiron game, focusing on four key players both on and off the field. Essentially, one of the main players on the team had passed away unexpectedly the previous year, so this match was being played in tribute to him. A very honourable project to say the least, but covering it from a sound perspective was going to be no small feat. First things first though, this is an opportunity for me to take the new sound cart for a test drive. It's very much in its prototype stage, it's a proof of concept for myself to see if it's going to work for a much larger shoot I have later in the year, so don't judge it too harshly. Everything has to start somewhere and I'm all about trying new things and playing around to see whether they work or not. Basically at its heart, it's a Sound Devices 664 12 track recorder. On this front panel is a custom milled faceplate that accommodates six Electrosonics SRBs or 12 tracks of wireless, two Electrosonics UCR 411As for wireless booms, an audio root power distro and five volt USB power. In that big space underneath, that's where a uh, Sound Devices CL12 is going to eventually sit. Like I said, it's all very bare bones at the moment, but what you see is the product of months and months of soldering and custom wiring. So I'm crossing all my fingers and toes that it will work perfectly and all the routing I've done works flawlessly. <laughs> the person you see running around in the background is my sound assistant for tonight, Zach. When the job came up, I asked him right away if uh, he was available and if he liked to run. Uh, I'll have a bunch of boom mics working tonight, but my main two will be a Shope CMIT 5U uh, for all the run and gun work and a Sennheiser 816. This mic is going to be super important for this shoot. Zach's principal responsibility is going to be running up and down the edge of the field, chasing the players and the ball with the 816. The mic is a super cardioid condenser mic, and it's over twice as long as most other microphones. The extra length makes it a hyper-directional mic, which means its reach is a lot longer than the CMITs. So by chasing the players, I'm hoping to get a lot of the visceral contact and impacts, the kicks, the tackles. Um, I've talked in previous videos about boiling a concept down to its core messages, what is the director trying to say by telling this story? And in this case, this shoot is all about the brutal nature of the sport, which is juxtaposed with the story of the fallen player. So from a sound perspective, I have to ask myself, what can I do to try and help tell that story? I'm hoping having the players mic'd combined with the sound from the 816 will tell a very clear story indeed. But we'll talk more about that later. We've got a lot of time to get set up. Call time was about 2 p.m. and I don't think the game started until about 6. The early call time was mainly for the camera team to talk strategy um, and watch a practice match. Uh, I'm certainly not complaining though. Um, I needed all the setup time that I could get. <laughs> Uh, as I said, this is a very ambitious shoot. I'll be miking up four key players with two mics each, two wireless booms, a talkback track so I can communicate with Zach, and a series of crowd Atmos mics. I'm not going to lie, I'm a little nervous about putting my expensive Electrosonics radio mics out into an environment where they're not going to be treated very well. But when I was pitched the idea, there, there really was no choice. Miking players in sporting events gives an unprecedented level of access for the audience into the action. And since we're not just filming a game, we're filming these players and bringing a human element to the story, we have to be able to hear them, to follow them throughout the game. And I've said it before, but I'll say it again, a boat in the harbour is beautiful, 
but that's not what boats are made for. This gear is meant to be used. It's meant to be put into risky situations for the chance to get amazing sound. Sure, the gear is nice to look at on a shelf, but honestly, that's not what the gear is made for. This beast is the Sennheiser 816. It's a long mic. I've rigged it up with one of my Electrosonics HM wireless boom transmitters so that Zach can be completely hands-free while running. So here's a closer look at one of the Electrosonics shark fins. Dealing with RF is a masterclass all of its own. There are so many variables and calculations to take into account when figuring it all out it honestly makes my head hurt sometimes. These antennas are active or powered antennas, meaning they require a small amount of phantom power to work, but they cannot be mounted directly to the cart. They are designed to be used with a very long cable run. The thinking behind that is that an active antenna actually creates a powerful RF field of its own. And if uh, it's anywhere too close to your radio mic receivers, they can generate interference. So by attaching them to a long BNC cable, the RF that feeds back will hopefully be dissipated by the cable's own resistance rating. See what I mean? It's, it's complicated as hell. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters to me is that that little green LED light lights up. That means it's working. But if you're about to delve into using or buying your own external antennas, I would suggest you do your research. I bought these shark fins early on in my career, mostly because I thought they looked cool. Uh, I had no idea about RF or resistance or powered antennas versus unpowered antennas. Uh, I suggest you ask around. There is a wealth of knowledge in the sound recording community. Okay, so let's have a look at the rest of this panel. Down here, we have our power, mains and 12 volt. The end goal is that if there's ever a power outage and the cart loses power, uh, it will be rigged so that it automatically switches to battery power, but that's still a ways off just yet. Then up here, I have a wireless boom, uh, one and two, and below that is time code in and time code out. Like I said, I wanted this to be like a patch bay. The 12 TA3 connectors on the top are the 12 radio mic channels and the 12 below are the 12 inputs for the sound devices 664. The idea is I can route radio mic channel 6 into 664 input 2 if I wanted. Modularity is very important to me and I want to be able to change it around on the fly if I have to. This idea works well in theory, but I probably need to build some custom cables that are a more suitable length because at the moment it's an absolute mess. And if I had to do any last minute routing changes, I wouldn't be able to make heads or tails of which track is which. But hey, you know, you know that's okay. It's just a trial run. Um, these are all things I'll note down to fix once the shoot's over. But for now, I'm just glad that it all works. All the routing is correct. I've soldered it all properly. Thank God. All right, we're about to start recording now. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to film how I mic'd up the players. It all happened so fast that I couldn't get the camera in position quickly enough. But this is a picture of how I plan to position the transmitters. Gridiron players wear this crazy tight series of interlocking plates uh, to protect their bodies from violent impacts, uh, which is good for me since uh, anywhere I put the transmitter, I knew it would be fairly secure. If I had more time and this was an ongoing gig, I probably would have insisted on building some kind of custom housing for the transmitter since even though it works fairly well here, it definitely isn't a long-term solution. So let's have a closer look at what's happening here. This was my recording setup. I put two mics on each player, one set slightly higher and one set much lower. 
The plan is that this will capture a much wider range of sound pressure levels. And that's the difference between loud noises and quiet noises. The transmitter that's set to slightly higher gain can capture all the regular speaking levels, but will blow out when the players shout or crash into each other. And the transmitter that's set to a lower gain will hopefully capture all of that, but it will be useless when it comes to recording regular speaking volume. Gold is returned left, green is returned right. So far, so good. Where's Ranieri? Ranieri, 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 jump off. Jump off, jump off, Ranieri's coming. What are we doing yeah. right now? Jump out, jump out. No, I mean, what, go like this. this slot, break your slot, leg. slot. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, it's just like this. A no. little bit closer. <clears throat> Despite the issues, I need to learn to live with them. I can try and get the radio mics in the best positions they can be, but once the game starts, then it's in the hands of fate. I can't stop the game to rescue a transmitter that's come loose or, or diagnose an interference issue. What we get is what we get. I've set things up as best I can, and now all I can do is just let the game play itself out. So while I can, I'm going to listen carefully to each mic individually and try to detect if there's any problems or potential issues that are coming up that I can preemptively solve. It's basically now or never. I probably won't get the opportunity to later. I'm very grateful to have Zach as my assistant. He can jump in and solve minor issues as they pop up. This is just the pre-game warm-up and team strategy discussion. Uh, it's also our opportunity to work out any kinks in the workflow. Um, one of those kinks is actually about to present itself. Believe it or not, it's actually ridiculously difficult to listen to 10 tracks of audio <laughs> all playing at once. As a result, if there's a problem with one of the radio mics, I'm probably not going to pick up on it straight away. As you can see from these waveforms, I've completely lost the boom. Luckily, Zach needs to use this mic to communicate back to me so it doesn't take me long to realize uh, there's a problem when I don't hear from him. I have like seriously, I got over there. And just doing their free game now. All right, I'm going to run you over the other thing. Well, I can't figure out what the problem is. So as a temporary short-term solution, I'm running to Zach with the other boom. I uh, can use the 816 for now until I can figure out what the problem is with the CMIT and why it isn't transmitting. Okay. Ready? <laughs> Set. So as it turned out, the phantom power on the boom transmitter had accidentally been switched off, meaning the CMIT had no power supply to continue working. Um, Zach hasn't used this equipment before, so he must have accidentally switched it off while making a gain adjustment. Uh, so no harm done. Whoa. Ready! Let's go to the shops, let's get a yeah. shirt that's you know, two sizes too small and you know, show off what you got, why not? Coming up in the onset breakdown. All right, so the game has started. I have eight mics out on the field right now, but I wouldn't have the first clue about where any of them are. There's lots of anger, lots of shouting. He's down by contact! Let's have a look at the sound recordings. <laughs> 